Welcome in to another episode of Your Drone Questions Answered, brought to you by Drone Launch Academy. I'm your host, Chris Breedlove. Today, I'm excited to welcome Thane Cole Morgan from FreeFly Systems to help us answer this question. How are drone tethers being used and where do we see them going in the future? So Thane, thanks so much for joining the show. Yeah, no problem. Hey, everybody, my name is Thane Cole Morgan. I'm currently a sales engineer here at FreeFly. Before that, I worked at a company called TerraClear where I was actually more on the operating side. So have a whole lot of time behind M300s, Firefly 6, if anyone remembers that drone and uh, the Harris Aerial. So got a bunch of different platforms, uh, but now, now I'm selling drones. Awesome. So before we kind of maybe go through some of these different aspects of tethers, I think Maybe a good place to start, and we've talked about offline, is from the legal regulatory perspective, as far as it sits here in the United States today here in, let's say, Q1 2025, what, if any, real regulatory exemptions are there for operating a tethered UAS? As far as I understand it, you're not getting a whole lot of leeway with the tether. You basically have to be a public safety agency, and there's some specific requirements around what that means and what type of activity you're doing to qualify as one of those. And then the drone has to be under 4.4 pounds. So it's a smaller platform at that point. And it's only under that situation where you don't have to worry about part 107. Otherwise, you know, it's basically treated as any other normal drone operation from the operator standpoint where you have to have 107 and do do the rest uh but kind of by the book there so you're not really getting a whole lot of exemptions you know if you're up outside that category yeah absolutely it has to even be used for a so-called you know public purpose or qualified governmental function but why tether why have folks been tethering to this point why do you see it maybe from your own perspective and maybe free Fly's perspective as this as an emerging thing that's worth doing for drone operators out there. So I think it's good to start from first principle. Like what is a tether? Why is it actually different than any other scenario? And when would you use it? And the essential function of a tether is one, you have continuous power, which means you can basically stay in the air indefinitely. And then two, you're stationary, not completely stationary, but you, you get what I mean. You're not going to go do a mapping mission with a tether. There might be some exemptions to that in like the Ukraine situation where they've been tethering with like super long fiber optic cables. So we can maybe talk about that in a second. But I think when most people think of tether, they're like, hey, this is this is kind of like a tower situation. It's just rather than a physical pull, we have a drone that's got some sort of payload and uh, you have power that can go to it. So what situations would you want a thing just sort of continuously in the air in a stationary environment? And how would that differ from like other scenarios where you have something stationary? I think the last piece of this puzzle is that it's stationary, but also temporarily. So like you could technically take this system down and move it. So if you add all that together, you know, one thing that comes to mind would be like security. Maybe, you know, typically you probably have some security cameras that you would install somewhere, but now you're violating that one principle that we just outlined, which is that it's no longer temporary. You're setting that system up. It's like fixed. You're not going to move it. But with a tethered drone, you can throw up a camera quickly. You could have it basically up there hanging out for an indefinite amount of time. And then, you know, if you do need to move it or you just need to completely pack up somewhere and get out of there, then you're done. So like events, you know, any sort of type of security for events would be pretty, pretty big. If you wanted to set up like a temporary perimeter, maybe you have like a project somewhere, maybe you're mining or maybe you're doing like you have some sort of security, something going on, whatever, and you need to set up a, a temporary grid and just be there. There's another scenario. So there's all these kinds of like interesting things that come up, but it's really like, I need to be up in one place for an indefinite amount of time, but I also need the flexibility of rapid, like setup movement if necessary. It's not a permanent installation. Absolutely. What about other benefits? Obviously not having to go up and down and up and down and swap batteries, but are there other benefits of typical tethering? Is it like, is data download or upload speeds that much quicker typically being run through a cable or what other benefits are there of the physical tether setup? I think data is a good one. Like you can have a data link just going directly into the drone. You're no longer constrained by the drones. Like let's say you want to do some sort of processing in the field. You're not going to be constrained by what you can get down to the controller uh, or what you can fit on the drone. You can now stream whatever data is coming from this the sensing apparatus on the drone down to a tether system where maybe you have like a whole lot more compute going on that then also has connectivity to somewhere else. You know, so again, like maybe if you're in, in a broadcasting environment, maybe you want to run some sort of analytics on that software or whatever on the data feed, or you want to broadcast it out to like a TV station or something like that. 
you can't do any of that on the drone, but if you have all that set up in the ground and the, and the drone is just like another feed, then you could actually go ahead and route that somewhere and do something with the data. So that's, that's another probably important one to call out. Yeah. Any other sort of just like high level general benefits of tethers or are those maybe the main ones that, that really stand out to you? I think those are the main ones. You know, something else to sort of call out here is a little bit of a twist to the conversation, but I think there will be like different generations of tethers. You know, tethers like at this point have never, I don't see any sort of like ubiquitousness with them. They're not like widespread use just yet. So I think we're pretty early on in the sort of evolution of these types of products. But just like people have talked about with DFR, you have like DFR one, two, three, whatever. So there's different evolutions here. I think we're, you'll have something similar with Tether. Like there have been a few purpose-built Tether systems. There's also, also been some aftermarket stuff that gets attached onto Tether systems. But, I th you know, those are all kind of early stage things. We're not quite at to the point where you're going to have like this nice vertically integrated setup for like the whole rig is like you have an app, a control app and everything that is like purpose-built for this tether system has like menus and UX all sort of tailored to that. There's sort of a progression I see with all this where eventually like that's the, the terminal end state of this is just like I go in and it's just like right now when you have any sort of mapping mission on a drone, you got menus and everything all customized for mapping. You know, the sort of end state of tethers will be like something like that. I want you to go to this height. I want you to point at this direction or do this or if it's got a light on it. I want you to flood the area with this amount of light, like whatever it is that you're going to be doing with the tether. I think it'll end up having like customized UI UX associated with it. And in, in the end, yeah, if you're able to share from like just from the free fly perspective, you know, what kind of gotchas or what, what things have come up, maybe if there's any you can share from a testing perspective, as far as like, all right, it's not just, we figured out or we're pulling power here and we're running our data feed there. What have y'all learned from that perspective at, at FreeFly? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a bunch of different things. And honestly, our engineers would probably be able to speak on this better. But, you know, one of the things that really jumps out is a drone is used to kind of flying and correcting itself on its own. It's not used to having like some extra line attached to it. So like getting this whole tension control part figured out is super important. If you're too slack or if the drone's tuned in a way that let's say you end up with slack uh, in your tether line, and the drone's parameters are not tuned properly. So it goes to correct where it thinks it needs to be at. And it corrects in a really big way. All of a sudden, you're going to create like this whiplash that might actually damage the tether. Or it might create like this actual, it's almost like pilot-induced os oscillations with manned aircraft. You know, you're coming in, you try to land, you, you start to adjust to your mistake. That creates more of a mistake. And before you know it, you're in this unstable porpoising situation. You can end up the same thing with tethers if you don't have your control apparatus set up properly you react to you know whatever slack you had that creates like this tension problem that snaps you back the controls then react to that and before you know it you're like fighting yourself to pieces a lot of stuff in that from a controls perspective that you need to get right that way you're not just like snapping your line or damaging your aircraft or something bad like that that's probably a pretty big one some other ones you know you have to go through and then make sure and make sure that the reliability of your system and everything is is going to be up to snuff with actually operating for let's call it like maybe you want to be up for 10 hours or something like that you know usually drone operations are 30 to 40 minutes and you come down and land you swap some batteries you know it's just you're not going for that long so you have to be pretty confident about the reliability of all of your components etc to make sure they're actually good to just be operating for super long endurances. Heat becomes a big thing. You know, you're passing a lot of uh, power through the whole system continuously. So you got to make sure no nothing melts or gets too hot. Those are just some, some things. Yeah. What are maybe the quintessential use cases, maybe some emerging use cases as well, where you see tethers really being a, a sweet spot and a good fit? Yeah. So I, th I think temporary security will be a big one. Like broadcast will also be uh, a pretty big one. You know, on the temporary, it's funny, each one of these, like you have this high order and then you have, okay, who's going to actually go do that on the temporary security front. If you're a military base or something like that, or some sort of exploratory military situation, maybe you haven't set up a permanent installation yet, but you need to get something up that might fit under that. If you're doing security for an event, your police department, you know, or some, some sort of agency that needs to kind of watch out for an event that's going to happen. Maybe it's a speech, maybe it's a sporting event, whatever. Like that kind of also falls under their sporting events, kind of all go underneath the broadcast. I mean, you could see this with like rally car races. You know, if you're going to have like a rally car race in uh, like Baja or something like that, you're going to set up 
have your event and then you're going to leave. I'm sure like Red Bull and those guys would be interested in something like that. They're always doing cool events and broadcasting stuff from all over the place. So there's kind of all this, this whole like broadcast subset. One that we're pretty interested in is temporary lighting. Right now that's kind of done with light poles, but maybe you want to go higher. Maybe you want a bigger area where you can have lighting. And so you have kind of this temporary light that goes up on a drone. There's a whole bunch of things that you could do with that. One would be like a emergency, maybe it's nighttime, you have an emergency situation, you need to set up a, a camp somewhere or a just kind of like a, a quick emergency installation, I guess. And you just need to provide light for people there who are working, maybe have a construction site that's got 24 seven work that's going on and you need to light up an area. Maybe there's a crash. So you need to light that up and make sure that's okay. I mean, there's all these sort of situations where you might just want some light in an area and you need to quickly set it up, keep it going for an indefinite amount of time, and then, you know, remove it at the end. So that's kind of like, it fits right under those sort of first principles around when you would use this pretty nicely. Yeah, that's great. So what has FreeFly been working on? It's been a really cool kind of general discussion, but what have y'all, I guess, just recently announced in the tethering and, and I guess lighting space? So, I mean, not to go too far into our own stuff, but we were pretty excited about product they were making called Flying Sun. It's basically what it sounds like. It's just a giant flying light. There's basically two sizes. There's one that goes on the Alta Extra and one that goes on the Astro. It kind of fits under those use cases that we talked about. The sort of trial customers right now are DOT customers. So I think they're going to be using it kind of for what we just talked about there. Like, hey, there's a crash. It's at night. You know, it's, it can be dangerous if you don't light up an area when there's a crash situation. Other people might not be able to see it. People might not know what they're, what they're doing. There might be material left over from the crash that needs to be cleaned up that you can't see. And right now with, you know, the sort of downside of a light tower that currently stands is one, they're just not as bright. They can't go as high. They're not as bright. They're more of a pain to move around. So they kind of go on like this little trailer thing and you can't really drive super fast with those just because it's such a small, anyone who's driven like small little trailers will kind of understand what I'm not talking about here, but they're just kind of like difficult to move around. You're speed limited. You can kind of contrast that with what we're building. It can go super high. It's got, I mean, you probably like anywhere from, depending on the light tower, people are talking about like up to five times as much lighting area. It's variable. So you can decide on what you want to light up rather than just being with this sort of fixed height. And then lastly, you know, I think when it'll, it'll be really cool is when people could integrate it with like a, an electric vehicle truck an electric truck, whether it's a Ford F-150 or whatever, you can just have that thing right in the back. It's plugged into that truck. You can move the truck wherever you want at the speed of a truck. You can get it up into, you know, difficult terrain if you got four by four. So you just have a very mobile, very, very bright light, which just can be used for all these different things. Yeah. No, that's cool. So where do tethers go from here? I mean, there's a couple ways to take a question. I'll start off on the regulatory side. I have no idea where this goes from a regulatory standpoint. I will say, I think the current mood with regulations is that they're too onerous. They're blocking innovation. Other countries are kicking our butts because they have better regulatory environments, especially for manufacturing and hardware. And, you know, there's a desire to want to bring down all those barriers to entry and all that sort of sclerosis in our economic system. So I'm hopeful that this video can be part of that. Hopefully people can talk with their local governments, et cetera. But I, I'm like hundred percent agree with that line of thinking. I think we were an innovative country in the 1880s because it was very easy for anybody to go invent and do stuff and get to market. And also for it to use. If people are limited on the use case, people can't figure out what it's useful for. So hopefully that momentum kind of continues and can help us out in this space. But in, in terms of the product, we're early days. We're going to start off with basically things that are being adapted to current drones that are set up for generalist purposes. It'll probably be a little hokey. It'll do some cool stuff. It'll open up new, new things, new use cases that drones aren't currently being used for. And then once those get figured out, I think it'll be similar to what you see in SaaS, software as a service stuff. Like there was a whole bunch of generalized SaaS that was created. And then all of a sudden people were like, okay, we can use it for this. We can use it for that. And then the next big wave was vertical SaaS. Like we're going to go make an accounting system for this type of company because there are particular things that this sector needs out of an accounting system that a generalized accounting software system like doesn't actually address properly. And so you streamline the UI, you add the right features, et cetera, for that use case. I think you'll see the same thing with tethers especially because they aren't like other drones. When you can move around and have different sensors and stuff, it makes sense to be more general. But if you're in a fixed place doing a temporary thing for a little bit of time, that is a pretty 
specific need and you need specific UX, UI design for that use case. So long-term, to, just to keep going with our, with the light thing, I think you'd want like something that basically just is a press button to go up. You have a little screen that says, okay, here's, here's how high I want you to go. Here's like the amount of light I want you to throw down, how much area, maybe like where I want it to be pointed. And you'll just have like an app and UX interface that is specifically designed for that purpose. I think long-term, you'll basically get these different use cases broken out from a UI UX perspective and it'll just be, it should be very easy and very helpful for whatever it is that you're doing. Now that makes sense. Well, I think that's a perfect place to, to leave it for today. Then again, thank you so much for jumping on. And to our listeners, as always, if you got a question you want us to tackle on this show, please visit ydqa.io. Drop me a line at chris at dronelaunchacademy.com or submit it in the Drone Launch Connect community. Until next time, have a great week.